Can you kind of talk about, like, for example, for providers in California, as you know, all schools for the most part have, have opened with distance learning, there was a lot of challenges in terms of providers um, who are working within the public school system and, you know, are they getting funded? Are they, you know, how are we going to be serving kids with IEPs? Do you have kind of a up-to-date info on legislative action and kind of the current state of affairs in California? Um, so yes and no, um, because, you know, every district is handling it differently. So in California, when school went out in March, they passed legislation that indicated that the districts would be fully funded and that the contractors should be paid. But apparently that, that language was not binding. So districts didn't have to pay their contracted providers. So if we had NPAs um, providing those services, then districts, some districts just decided not to pay. Some districts decided to pay in full. Some districts decided to only pay for services rendered through virtual learning. So it was, you know, all over the map. And then um, and now that we're going back to school, districts are doing, you know, similar, they're all making different decisions. So some said, we're only going to pay for services rendered. Um, so if you have, you know, seven hour, six hour um, BT, who's supposed to be providing those services in school, you know, how long can a kid really log in and, wh and what's in their best interest? We don't want to push them, but we have these employees that, you know, agencies are struggling with. Um, and then the new thing that um, is, you know, happening, I think, across the state is that um, districts are allowing NPA providers to go in homes in some cases um, to provide those services, but not allowing their district employees to go in home. So it's also going to create like a disparity and access issue between students who have NPA support and students that don't. Um, so it, you know, it's it's an interesting What's time. What's MPA? In What's an MPA is a non-public agency Sorry. and an MPS is a non-public school. And so these are designations that um, organizations can um, be uh, credentialed for through the California Department of Education to be allowed to uh, receive uh, contracts from public school entities or SELPAs to work with special education um, students. Nice. Okay, thanks. How are they rationalizing that difference that some get a go in home but district employees don't. I bet it's union I bet it's union stuff it's it's union it's contracts it's also the fact that NPAs are, are typically behavioral agencies and so they've they've continued to provide services in home during this time and they have all the precautions and those people also ha likely have a higher level of training because they're trained to go in home where a school paraeducator is really not trained to to deal with the intricacies of a home environment but I think it's also a contractual issue where they, they don't want school districts and liability don't want their, um, their employees going in home. So that. it's creating a massive disparity. Well, and I feel like this is just like a small exemplar of like the larger problem in the United States, which has been, there's not been a coordinated response. There's not been a coordinated federal response. Um, there's not been even a coordinated state response. There is a tremendous amount of confusion um, depending on where you, you live. Um, and that's, you know, I think kind of contributed, like this is where our kind of idea of like American independence, the fact that we, we do pro give states so much latitude um, in terms of their legislation and governance, it hasn't been, I think in this instance during the pandemic, it's been challenging because there's not like this like, hey, this is how we all do things as, an, as Americans. It's like, well, this is how we do things in the Bay Area, but if you're in LA, it might be different. But if you cross over to Nevada, it's totally different. And I, I think that that also has like stoked um, more divisiveness and frankly, a lot of misinformation in terms of like how certain areas choose to do certain things based on kind of cherry picking information. Um, it, I think it's been really frustrating. Finding the information is unbelievably hard too. Like I pride myself in being able to search and find shit on the internet. Like I grew up learning how to do that really well. And it took me like three hours the other night to actually know like what the hell was the plan for Nevada because it was constantly updated through a series of different, um, I don't know if they were like amendments to the executive order or like what you would call them, but there's been 30 so far and it doesn't have a summary sheet of here's where we're at. What it says is in every single one is this is potentially going to be overridden if we've said anything contradictory in the past ones. So you have to have all 30 of them next to each other to actually understand what's what. 
and Michelle's shaking her head like, yeah, this is, this is, this is what I do all the time in public policy. Um, but like, how do we not have, I was just trying to figure out if we had moved, um, like when and when and we would be moving from like 10 to 50 to like these like public gathering sizes and like where were some of the, the boundaries in between the phases. And it turns out that what we did is they completely went with a phased approach and then they said, no, we're not going to do the phased approach. Um, and they just left it all in the bills. So it's, for me, it's like there's failure at the federal court, like response level. And there's like complete failure at just like basic communication, like, basic communication of here's what you should expect living in this state right now. Right. Well, I'm, I'm laughing because yeah, that we've experienced the same thing in California with orders from our department of developmental services. You know, they've issued all these directives, but you literally have to have the whole stack of all the directives mm -hmm. and you have, and, and that's what I've been doing. Every time they issue one, I go in and, you know, write those summaries and try to figure it out. And then um, I asked our Calaba lobbyist the other day um, if, in fact, this the shelter in place order had been lifted because there was some workers comp changes that say like 60 days after the shelter in place order has been lifted. And it took us a while to even figure out if, in fact, the shelter in place order is still in effect statewide or not. And I'm thinking like this is a lobbyist. And she was struggling with it too. So yeah. um, we're not the only one. We're all struggling. And even people that do this for a living are struggling to figure it out. But by the way, we've, we're fairly certain that the stay in stay at home order in California is still in effect. Yeah, I was gonna say, I don't think it's ever been, I've never heard any language that it hasn't, that it's been lifted. It's just that we're in phases of it now, but then is it when we get to phase four, that's when it specifically lifts? Like, I don't know. And I, I think something that's been so interesting through this is just the importance of attending to legislation. And as a public policy person, that's what I've been doing for the last decade, but it's never been more important to be able to attend to it and understand it and interpret it and put it into action than it has in the last six months. Mm -hmm. So I've never been more glad I have that skill set, but even then it's still so difficult.